So nearby Lucas, I would like to ask you your favourite Metallica or Beatles song so we could play a clip of it for the audience at home. But we want to make money from this video, so we're not going to do that. It's just f***ing shame, innit? It really is. And like, do you mention Beatles just because I assume they're really hot on copyright strikes as well? They're also mentioned in the video. Ah, right, okay. I just thought this was about Metallica. No, no, because the, the band we're talking about is not Metallica, it's Beatallica. The band Metallica have a notorious and well-earned reputation for being a bunch of petty assholes when it comes to using their music. Yep, we can speak to that, can't we, Lucas? To so the point where they got a copyright strike essentially done on themselves. Yes. Can't remember, was it like TwitchCon or something, something like, like that? that yeah. And Twitch had to mute the audio on the stream for Metallica because yep. Metallica are so bad about copyright strikes. Yeah, so Metallica themselves got muted doing an online concert. Well, didn't you say Herman Lee got a copyright struck as well? Yes, Herman Lee of Dragon Force fame um, got a copyright strike on his Twitch channel, which I highly recommend people go follow. He's just an amazing personality. Mm -hmm. But I've met him once or twice, here's a picture. As you might imagine, he frequently plays his own songs on stream because he's well known for that one song. And unlike a lot of artists who I feel get annoyed by being associated with one song, Herman Lee loves it. Right, and he yeah. often like, you know, does reactions to people playing um, through the Fire and the Flame guitar solo and stuff like that. And he just one day got a copyright strike for playing his own song, <laughs> a song he wrote. <laughs> and that's why we've not been able to do the planned Guitar Hero Fact Fiend live stream. Like, just pass me one of the fucking guitars we've got. Like, we've got an entire, like, Guitar Hero setup in this office, folks at home, that we've been wanting to use for literally years. Like, we've spent, we for years, we've wanted to do a full, just like, band <laughs> live stream. Yep. And it would be banned, literally, if we try to do it. And that's why we've launched the untitled side channel, isn't it, Lucas? It is, yeah. And it's we're recording it before the, the channel is live and anyone knows about it, but it should be out by the time that this is out. And that side channel... Whoa! It's fine. It's fucking... It's fine. <laughs> and that channel does not have ads run against it, so we should be able to use more things like copyrighted music and have streams where we play stuff like Guitar Hero without getting in trouble. With everything I mentioned about Metallica in mind, it may surprise you to learn that the band once stuck their metaphorical neck out for a cover band that blended their music with another infamously tight ass group of musicians when it comes to using their music, the Beatles. We've already mentioned Luke as the name of the band, Beatallica, but would you like to hazard a guess at what Beatallica is? I would presume it's probably like Beatles music, but played in like a metal style similar to Metallica. Yes, it is exactly that. It is the lyrics and uh, melodies of Beatles songs set to Metallica style riffs. <laughs> and it is fucking rad. And hopefully we can play a clip of these guys because these guys don't care if you use their music. All their music is freely available online. Hey, dude, it's true not said. And their history is kind of muddled, but from what I've been able to piece together, um, they formed as a joke for a one-off spoof concert that was full of similar style cover bands and handed out a few EPs as a souvenir. And those EPs ended up getting leaked online, uh, which led to the creation of a website dedicated to the band, which the band were not aware of until they started meeting people, asking them about it. And stuff like that is so hilarious to juxtapose next to a band like Metallica, who very infamously sued Napstar and their own fans for simply trying to share their music and just like, you know, their fandom. And, and these get, guys are like, accidentally getting the fandom sharing it for them. Yes, and uh, they realise, oh wow, people like what we're doing. And the band not only gave their blessing to the website, but continue to release all of their music online for free. That's cool. And they've had like a couple of albums and they're still going to this day. Like when I was researching this article, uh, it was on their website and they've got like upcoming tour dates for 2022. And for anyone curious about the legality of what the band's doing, it's all completely above board, at least in America, because it's parody, and parody is covered um, uh, under fair use. And the most famous example of a parody musician is Weird Al. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story goes that Weird Al is well within his rights to parody any song that he wants, but to maintain a good working relationship um, with the music industry, he always asks permission. It's probably worked out for Weird Al over the years that everybody actually likes his music and 
likes the fact that he asks permission and people know that it's going to happen. Yeah, and it's like he's become like an elder statesman mm. of like comedy and music now. Where I don't think there's anyone out there who's got a bad thing to say about Weird Al. Everybody loves Weird Al. Yeah. <laughs> and he's gone on, and the old joke is that he's been making music longer than a lot of the people he's parodied. Yes. Like he's yeah. been more, he's been relevant for longer than they have. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's there's a couple of funny stories. Like I think Prince was the one. It was his. White Whale. He never managed to convince Prince to oh, um, right. sign off on him parodying any of his music. And even though Weird Al could if he wanted to, because Prince wouldn't personally give him his permission, he never felt like he was right. And the story is that they were going to be at like an event together and he just got a telegram saying, do not look at Prince. <laughs> <laughs> just don't look at Prince. I presume like Metallica must know about this band because that's what the story's about. Yes. Uh, members of Metallica are aware of Beatallica and have had nothing but positive things to say about them, describing Beatallica as, and I quote, cool. <laughs> and the members of Beatallica are super stoked about that and that quote is on their website. Of course They're just cool, like Kirk Hammett, I think it was who said it. Or yeah. maybe Lazar. I don't know which member of the band said it, well, one member of the band did. And every other member of the band has said something positive about them in interviews over the years. And the Beatallica reportedly have a um, amicable, if hands-off and distant relationship with the band. Yeah, of course. Because yeah. you know Metallica's too busy, you know, doing Metallica things like suing fans, I imagine. And at least one occasion, illegally downloading music themselves. Because I think that's one of my favourite little tidbits about um, Metallica is that Lars Ulrich, who's noted as being one of the most like aggressive defenders of like copyright stuff like once downloaded one of Metallica's songs from the Pirate Bay just to see what it was like. When he was asked, is that not a bit hypocritical? He's like, well, if anyone has the right to download it for free, it's me. I mean, I suppose that's true. <laughs> he presumably has like the original fucking masters in his house. Yeah. In regards to Metallica, um, unfortunately, they've never heard from the Beatles. So while they do have like, you know, a somewhat amiable relationship with Metallica, um, according to them, they've never confirmed one way or the other what the Beatles and think of their music, but they don't mind that. And they've said, in regards to it, and I quote, if any of us were marrying models half our age and still rocking out around the world, we'd have other things to attend to. So they've probably got other things to do besides, like, you know, listen to a cover of a song they wrote 45 years ago. I'm sure Paul McCartney is a very busy man. <laughs> Thing is, though, he doesn't have to be, but he yeah. probably is. Whilst the band have never heard from the Beatles, they have heard from their lawyers, like a lot. And the story goes that in 2005, Metallica started receiving threatening emails from Sony, who owned the back catalogue for the Beatles at the time. Uh, the band were very confused about these like vague threats because one, they were covered under parody law, and two, they were making no money from any of the music. Like they made some money from appearing at concerts and stuff like that. And technically, that is a problem. And my understanding of it is, is that copyright law is by definition very vague because mm. art itself is very hard to define. That's where you get the, the very famous quote about pornography of like, I don't know how to define pornography, but I know it when I see it. Yeah. And that's like a legal precedent sort of like, I don't know what copyright infringement is technically, but I'll know it when I see it. But it being so vague allows companies to interpret it in ways that are technically within the scope of the law, but not in the spirit of it. And as a content creator online, you can no doubt speak to this. I mean, literally fat theme viewers will know the, the problems we've had of this of like you can see that we put less clips in now because of shit like this yeah, yeah. and uh just fair use is a defense for stuff like this but if the company really really doesn't want you using their content they will eventually win because technically uh, you know you are in the wrong and the actual definition of face is so nebulously defined and like i said if, while the band weren't making any music from their music, they were, you know, appearing at concerts and that constitutes payment. And it's this whole legal clusterfuck that the band just did not want to deal with and were genuinely worried about, oh, I guess we just have to take all the music down. Yeah. Because we can't afford to fight the $30 billion legal arm of Sony. <laughs> or at least they couldn't. So they got a mysterious savior in the form of the aforementioned knobhead Lars Ulrich. So where the fuck did Lars Ulrich come into this then? Well, Ulrich apparently just heard about it through the grapevine. Like, he heard that Metallica were having trouble and was really annoyed about it. Which is weird, isn't it? You think, like, this is the same guy who was, like, suing his own fans for sharing one of their songs. But like, he was annoyed that this band that was making money and getting success from, you know, their sound, their style, their imagery, and he was okay with it. 
And what Ulrich did is he contacted Metallica's lawyer, who, as you might imagine, is very well versed in copyright law. <laughs> They've dealt with it previously. Yeah, and he got him to draft a letter on behalf of Metallica and then sent it to Sony, basically telling them to cut that shit out. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sony mysteriously stopped trying to uh, threaten the band after that happened. And <laughs> it make, to make things just a little bit weirder, like, Ulrich was apparently on holiday when that happened. So he took time out of his time off to help the band. I don't know how to feel about this story because it's like, yeah, on, you've on, been such giant assholes about everything else, but you've been really cool about this one Yeah, thing. you know what? A broken clock's still right twice a day. There's a really eye-opening documentary I'd like to recommend called This Is Pop, mm. um, where they go to Sweden, where they just have this, these Swedish hit makers who basically wrote every pop song for the last like 25 years. And just when they go down the list of artists who've worked with them, mm -hmm. and you know, the artists come in and they do work, but they're not writing the songs or the melodies, those guys are. And they have a really great moment in it where there's this guy in a metal band who worked with them, talking about like, oh, we're just dicking around at a show once with a, with a riff. And he went like something like, dun la na 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 And you could probably already recognize that yeah, one. And then, yeah. oh, that sounds pretty good. We're working with Pink next week, show it to her. And it's one of the things where it's so subtle that I almost missed how good a dig this was, where the guy's like, yeah, we showed it to Pink, and she was really happy with it, and she wrote the lyrics to that song in 30 minutes, and they cut to Pink going, na 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 <laughs> And it's like, I wonder how she wrote those lyrics. <laughs> and just little moments like that, and there's so many stories from just the world of music now of, um, uh, like, I think, Hit Me Baby One More Time. That was originally supposed to be Hit Me Up Baby One More Time. And the reason that, that lyric makes no sense is it was written by a Swedish person, that's what that lyric means. They had to change it to hit me baby one more time to fit with the melody. And there's just so many examples of that in music where it's like, no, things get changed during the recording and editing process. And uh, whoever suggests those changes gets a, uh, a writing credit. That's a way and a half to get on a <laughs> writing credit, isn't it? What well, happened with that Lizzo song where she, the lyric is, I just took a DNA test and I'm 100% that bitch. Okay. Which was cribbed directly from a tweet from a lady that said exactly that. Oh, and yeah, Lizzo yeah. was like, well, I've never seen that tweet. And, you know, I just thought it was a saying that people said. And it's like, well, no, it's not. You clearly ripped off this tweet. Give this lady her credit. Mm -hmm. And they get, and that lady now has a writer's credit on that song. Oh, fucking hell. And yeah. I think she's celebrating going, I just took a DNA test and I'm 50% the writer of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah.